Welcome to Social Elo Ministries, where we are committed to glorifying God and exposing the devil. This is truly one of those messages where it's almost like it would be so great if I had a prepared script. But it's truly going to require the Holy Spirit to get me through this message and to also convey what the Holy Spirit of the Lord truly wants to say to His church. The title of the message is, Offense is a Fence. Initially the Lord gave me the message and then he gave me the title for it and it was a, an excellent play on word because offense creates a fence and it's also responsible and is a tool of the enemy to create division in the body of Christ. That's part of the reason why we have so many de denominations. A lot of times churches split because someone gets offended and the individual leaves, maybe takes others with him or her, starts a new church. And it just keeps on going almost as if there is no end. And I'll show you some examples or at least one example in the Bible of how there was a fellowship between two individuals and how they fell apart because of a disagreement. And a part of offense is a fence is that offense does create a fence. A fence between the offender and the offended. Now in some cases people are thin-skinned and they get offended easily. In other cases, the offender is insensitive. I was recently listening to a message and there are several debates in Christianity that's causing offense. In this case, the person was answering a question regarding if a Christian can have a demon. And the pastor gave an analogy. I mean, it seemed great, but <laughs> for many people who are struggling with this, it doesn't pass the test. It's not as brilliant an analogy as it came across as being. And the pastor made the analogy that if a fly lands on a burner of a stove that is cold, the fly can stay there. But if the burner is hot, then the fly won't be able to stay there without burning itself, so it must flee. And it kind of used that as a justification where James wrote, Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Well, the devil doesn't always flee immediately, even when there is heat. Satan tried tempting Jesus, and he didn't leave after the first rebuke. Jesus rebuked him three times, and then the devil left him, but only for a season. And one of the things I'll cover is actually a point in time when the devil came back, trying Jesus again. And Jesus was by no means lukewarm. No one can get more on fire than Jesus. In fact, it was John the Baptist who mentioned that he's baptizing with water, but one comes who baptizes with the Holy Spirit and fire. That's Jesus. So he made a great analogy. If a burner on a stove is cold, then a fly can land on it without issue. But if the burner is hot, then a the fly is going to suffer consequences. And devils do suffer consequences when they attack Christians. In some cases, demons are dwelling inside of Christians. And these Christians may be on fire for the Lord. But when a minister says stuff like that, because he or even she has never had to deal with that issue, then it may create an offense in someone who's going through that struggle. And a part of the offense, the person may actually be on, quote unquote, fire for the Lord. But because of what the minister says, then the person starts questioning, like, is he or she saved? Is he or she truly a Christian? Is he or she truly on fire for the Lord? But one of the things Jesus mentioned was about, denying ourselves, picking up, picking up our crosses, and following Him. In some cases, our cross to bear is, for example, demonic, demonic activity. The Apostle Paul mentioned that he beseeched the Lord three times to remove the messenger of Satan, the thorn in his flesh. And the Lord told him, no, my grace is sufficient for thee. So Paul had to endure it. So we never know what the Lord may allow for a person to go through. And it doesn't make them less, or in some cases, even more of a Christian. So we have to be careful. And a message I've been conveying here recently is we have to be careful when we do not have practical experiences with something. And yes, we may not see it in the Bible. So in a sense, we do not have a compass for it. But because we have never dealt with something, that we shouldn't assume that because someone is dealing with that, then, for example, they're in error. When Jesus healed a man who had been... Um, or question, when a man was blind from birth and his apostles asked him, who sinned, this man or his parents? 
And Jesus said, neither. Because that blindness was for the glory of God because Jesus was going to do something that no one else had done before. Thou to heal or open blind eyes. So even that illness was for the glory of the Lord. But they were assuming that the man was blind from birth because either he or his parents sinned. Likewise, in the book of Job, the Lord said that Job was perfect. He was perfect and he shunned evil. And when Job's friends saw him that he had been afflicted by the devil, they assumed that Job was in some kind of error. But the Lord called Job perfect. The Lord is allowed, allowing Job to go through a test. So we have to be careful. So there are a lot of times when offenses, it may be because a person is quote unquote thin skinned and other times it's because someone says or does something that is insensitive because they have never had to wrestle with it. For example, some people, they struggle with alcoholism. They struggle with alcohol. Others, it's no issue at all. It's like some people could drink like a fish and not even get drunk. They're, they're not addicted to it. While others, they could have some rum cake and they want to drink an entire bottle of rum because it's addictive to them. So different people have different struggles and we have to be sensitive to that. Other issues, for example, that is causing division in the body of Christ. For example, cessationism versus continuationism. continuationism. Are the gifts of the Holy Spirit still in operation or did they cease with the apostles? Some people in their argument have even, for example, said that John the Baptist was the last prophet. Well, if John the Baptist was the last prophet and Jesus lived after John the, Pro John the Baptist and Jesus was also a prophet, in fact, he was the prophet. He was also the apostle, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher. He was a real role model of all those things for us. So some people even say that John the Baptist was the last prophet, even though Jesus lived after him. In addition, the Bible also tells us about Agabus. In Acts 13, it tells us about prophets and uh, teachers who were gathered. So some people even make the, the argument, John the Baptist was the last prophet, as a way to say that the gifts of the Holy Spirit no longer exist or what is written in Ephesians 4.11 about the Lord before he ascended into heaven that he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers some will say that the only three or we can say ministry gifts that are in operation today are evangelist, pastor and teacher and say for example a person believes that the Lord has called him or her as a prophet and that person for example receives a revelation one night much like how when the Lord calls Samuel in 1 Samuel 3 or Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1 5 so the Lord called or a person believes the Lord has called him or her as a prophet and then the person goes to church on a Saturday night for example the person goes to church on a Sunday and then the pastor is preaching that prophets do not exist anymore and then the person's like hold up I know I had an experience with the Lord last night. He called me and now this pastor is telling me that prophets don't exist. It's like, what am I doing in this church? So that also creates an offense. Now clearly, if the pastor is preaching and saying that prophets do not exist anymore, that means he's not a prophet of the Lord. Now in some cases, he may be a prophet of the devil, but he's not a prophet of the Lord because if he was, he wouldn't be preaching against that there are no more prophets today. And from pop culture, like there's a, a debate regarding whether or not Kanye West is a Christian. And even today I saw something where someone posted a meme with Kanye West. And they had some images from his past regarding things that he had done. Now Kanye West is a public figure. What if you were a public figure and all the things that you've done because you sold your soul to the devil, all those things were on display and now you're trying to live a righteous life and people kept on bringing up your past. And those are the kind of things that the devil does. And I'm not saying whether or not Kanye West is a Christian or not, but we have to look at ourselves. And a lot of things creates offense. And we have to, be, we have to discern when the enemy is trying to create an offense to split people apart. Because even in a relationship, the enemy will try to, oh boy, the enemy will try to create an offense in a relationship. And I'll address this to men. For example, men tend to be 
visual creatures. They may meet a, a woman, and whether she's physically beautiful or spiritually beautiful, the man is attracted to that woman either because of her physical and or spiritual beauty. They get married, and then suddenly the, de the devil starts speaking to the man and starts painting a picture that the woman is not as attractive as maybe she used to be or as he originally thought. And as a result of that, then the enemy starts getting that man's attention to look at other women, even though his wife is just as beautiful as the day they met. But because the enemy can create that offense where it's like, well, she's not all that, then the man starts looking elsewhere. And we have to discern when the enemy is trying to speak those things to us and rebuke him the first time. Do not give him any room. I thought I would have started with the scriptures already. But um, again, I need the Holy Spirit to guide me through this. And it's not just a matter of um, reading scriptures. But a fence. It is a fence. And the fence is between the offender and the offended. And we have to be sensitive regarding the things others are dealing with. We may not understand, but we have to be careful about trying to, for example, use our experiences. Like with deliverance. There are some people where they got tormented by evil spirits. They prayed, and the Lord showed up that minute and delivered them of the spirit, and that spirit never returned. And then others, they've been wrestling with the, like, the same spirit for years. Some people have gone through deliverance. The spirit left, but then the spirit returned. Because even Jesus mentioned about spirits leaving, going to a dry place, and then returning to its former home. And in some cases, some spirits, or some people are dealing with spirits, that are of a higher rank. They're more stubborn. It takes longer for them to leave. And sometimes almost like Jesus himself have to show up because this spirit is so stubborn. And another person may be like, well, I had a similar issue. I prayed and the Lord delivered me in that moment. Think about also the man who Jesus healed and he made spittle with his eyes and told him to wash. The first time he didn't see clearly. For that, it was a process. And Jesus healed people in different ways. Sometimes it was instantaneous, sometimes it took a little while. Like when he healed ten lepers, they were walking away and then they noticed that they had been healed. And then one Samaritan returned to thank the Lord. And the Lord said that he had been made whole. What was the difference between them being healed and that one being made whole? So there are things where if we do not understand, it is okay as a minister to say you don't know, to abstain to seek the Lord and get his answer or even just a Christian to sometimes wait like with the Kanye West debate some people have made their opinions and then others in a sense you can say they're exercising wisdom by saying his fruits will show so give him time and you will see because regarding the Kanye West thing let's just say that he is pretending to be a Christian scripture says that God is not mocked and one of the worst things you can do is pretend to be a Christian because you're putting yourself up for greater damnation. It is one thing if you do thing, things, if you sin, without claiming Christ as your Savior. But when you claim Him as your Savior, and you're sinning, then you're trampling on His blood. When you say you know Him, and you're doing things contrary to His will, that is far worse. Now for the scriptures. To back all this stuff up regarding offense is a fence. Starting Matthew 18, verses 1 through 9 and I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible New American Standard Bible and I'll also refer to the King James Version of, how, of the Bible regarding how it may translate certain words so in Matthew 18 starting verse 1 at that time the disciples came to Jesus and said who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child to himself and set him before him and said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So we have to humble ourselves in a lot of ways. Especially as ministers, we have to humble ourselves. There's some things we do not know. We have not received a revelation on, on. And if someone asks you a question and you don't know, 
like I know with me, if someone asks me about my opinion, I don't want to give someone my opinion. I want to give someone what the Lord is saying, what the Bible says. And it's not just the Bible, because the Bible, they're words, and the words, they are spirit. And a part of that spirit, like Jesus said, is to have the Holy Spirit interpret those scriptures. Because in some cases, we may be able to point to a certain scripture about something, but if we inquire of the Lord, he will use another scripture. Like in John 8, those Pharisees tried tempting Jesus by bringing a woman who had been caught committing adultery. And they're talking about, according to the law of Moses, she should be stoned to death, which was accurate. But a couple of things, they were trying to tempt Jesus. Another thing is, according to the law, the man and the woman should have been stoned to death. So where was the woman? But Jesus didn't bring that up. And Jesus used a scripture all the way from the book of Exodus, where the Lord told Moses, I'll be merciful to whom I'll be merciful, and I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. So the Lord was gracious to the woman, even though the Lord said, or even in the book of Exodus, Exodus 20, with the Ten Commandments, that that woman should have been stoned to death because she committed adultery. God does not tolerate adultery. But Jesus, he didn't condemn her. He pardoned her. And he didn't break the law by pardoning her because there's another scripture that applies to it. Actually, two. That really comes to mind. The first was when the Lord told Moses that he will be gracious to whom he will be gracious and merciful to whom he will be merciful. In a sense, that same scripture was applied to David when David committed adultery with Bathsheba. When Nathan was rebuking David and imposing the Lord's punishment, Nathan said the Lord had put away David's sins. David still had consequences to pay, but the Lord put away his sins, meaning the wages of sin is death and the Lord did not put David to death. The Lord also knew that David had a repentant heart, and David did repent. And after Bathsheba, you don't hear anything about David committing adultery after that. He suffered some consequences. His family suffered, and that put him on the straight and the narrow path. So again, we have to be able to humble ourselves like little children. We call God Father, Abba Father, Heavenly Father. So we have to humble ourselves to Him like little children. And sometimes we want to be spiritual parents, and we may be quote-unquote spiritual parents, but even then we have to be able to humble ourselves like little children because we do not know everything. And we truly have to let the Holy Spirit guide us into all truth. And sometimes being led by the Holy Spirit, we are about to say something and the Holy Spirit will arrest us and we will not say what had come to mind. And even yesterday I was going to post something and it sounded good. And then the Holy Spirit arrested me because... If someone who was suicidal were to read that message, they could have gotten the wrong impression. And as a result, I didn't post that message on Facebook at all. Because the Holy Spirit arrested me because someone else could have taken the message the wrong way. In fact, at the very moment I'd written it, someone could have visited my page who was suicidal, seen that message, and that message could have pushed the person over the edge. So the Holy Spirit, He has to lead us. And of course, as it is written, those who are led by the sons of God or of course, those who are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. I continue. The Lord said, Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whosoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. So part of that, we're all the Lord, well, those who have accepted Jesus, we are, through the spirit of adoption, sons of God, sons and daughters of God. In 2 Corinthians 6, the Lord tells us to come out from among them, so he will accept us as sons and daughters. So we have to be careful that even in telling the truth, or what we perceive to be the truth, that we do not cause harm, that we do not cause others to stumble. Like in some cases, we may say something offensive that drives people out of a, our church, our ministry. That was uncalled for. It wasn't something that was meant to drive them to repentance, but it actually pushed them away and it pushed them further away from the Lord. Like there are some people who have been pushed out of churches 
And for example, like gifted individuals, spiritually gifted individuals who were pushed out of churches and now they're working for the kingdom of darkness because they were rejected in churches but they found acceptance in the kingdom of darkness. There are some people, for example, who the Lord has called as prophets. They were kicked out of churches. They're now operating as psychics, clairvoyants, because Satan saw that they had a gift and now he is using for his purpose because that's where they found acceptance and they didn't find it in church. Because, for example, some people are preaching that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are no longer in existence when they're gifted people in their churches. Saying that, for example, apostles and prophets no longer exist when people have that calling in their churches. But they were driven out. And the Lord continues, Woe unto the world because of its stumbling blocks. In the King James Version of the Bible, it says, Offenses. For it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. It is inevitable that offenses come. But woe unto the man through whom the stumbling block comes. We have to be careful that we do not become a stumbling block in someone's faith walk. Like Kanye West, if he is truly seeking the Lord, and people are arguing whether or not he's a Christian, they could end up, if he's truly seeking the Lord, they could end up pushing him back into the kingdom of darkness. And those who do that will have to give an account to the Lord. It is not the Lord's will that any should perish, but all, but that all should come unto repentance. And if someone is even trying to seek the Lord, and even in some cases in pretending to seek the Lord, because sometimes a person may pretend to seek the Lord and end up finding him, and falling in love with the Lord, start serving him. So again, woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks or offenses. For it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe unto the man through whom the stumbling blocks comes. And I'm recording outside so you may hear some noises like that motorcycle that is going by. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be cast into the eternal fire. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be cast into the fire hell. Now part of that and how we'll apply that last section There's actually a bug on my pant leg. I'm not editing that out. Okay. The Lord mentioned about if your hand cut a hand offends you about cutting it off. There, there are times when a person is offended in a church, and actually the right thing to do is to leave. Because, for example, a spiritually gifted individual who's in a church more bugs. A spiritually gifted individual who's in a church that doesn't accept or allow the gifts of the Holy Spirit, then that person could be in a church where that gift is not being used. And in the end, we will all have to give an account to the Lord regarding how we used our gift or gifts and calling. And if we don't use those gifts and calling, then we'll be like that the wicked servant where there are three the master gave them different sums of money and they invested the first two and then those, there was that one servant he buried you could say his gift from the master and when the master came to get, for him to give an account it's like I gave you that and that's all you haven't grown like in Hebrews speak about having our gifts exercised by reason of use so if the Lord has given you a gift, and because you're in a church that doesn't believe in that gift, and you're not using it, you have to give an, self or an account to yourself, of yourself to the Lord regarding how you stewarded that gift or those gifts that He gave you. And just the same way that unmerciful servant was cast away, you have to be careful. You have to be careful. So in some cases, especially if the Lord is telling you to leave, then you should leave if they're doing things to stifle your growth. 
your relationship with the Lord. Other times you need to stay and work it out. And this is where the Holy Spirit comes in, where you're being led by the Holy Spirit. So the Lord spoke about woe unto those who cause offense. Those who cause or those who become a stumbling block in someone's relationship with him. Even in um, Jeremiah 23, 1, where the Lord gave that woe about woe unto the shepherds who scatter and destroy the sheep of my pasture. That was serious. The Lord's going to hold those shepherds accountable. So the Lord spoke about offenses and that they will come. So we need the Lord regarding how we handle those things. And do not hold on to offenses. Same way if your hand offends or causes an offense and you symbolically cut it off. There's some things you need to cut out of your life so that it does not cause offense. Like the Bible tells us, be angry but sin not. Do not allow the sun to go down on your wrath lest you give place to the devil. So if you're getting offended, then it may cause anger. Anger may cause you to sin. It is possible to be angry without sinning. When Jesus went into the temple and saw the money changers, he made a scourge. He turned over tables, turned over all kind of stuff, whipped them. He was angry, but he didn't sin. So we have to be careful. Now, I mentioned about those offenses, and we have to be careful about the devil trying to cause offense, trying to cause division, trying to cause us to stumble regarding what the Lord has called us to do. In Matthew um, 16, start verse 20. Then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. From the time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This shall never happen to you. Now that sounds like a great thing, right? The Lord speaking about how he was going to go to Jerusalem, he was going to suffer, and he was going to be killed, but he'd be raised on the third day. But Peter was rebuking him. Why wouldn't Peter want Jesus to die? That was a part of the reason why he was sent here. What would Jesus' death do? And even more so, his resurrection. What would that do? Was it that Peter loved his master so much, he didn't want him to suffer? He didn't want him to die? And it's one of those things. Sometimes the Lord has an assignment for you. Others do not understand and they come at you either in a caring way or a harsh way. But if you listen to them, they're going to take you away from your calling. They're going to take you away from the very thing the Lord sent you here on earth for you to do. But he turned and said to Peter. Again, he turned and said to Peter. Get behind me, Satan. Oh! But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. He looked at Peter and called him Satan. Or did he look at Peter, saw Satan, and called out Satan? Because who would not want Jesus to fulfill his purpose here on earth? Who more than Satan? Because if Jesus were to succeed, then Satan would be defeated. So again, he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block or an offense to me. For you are, in, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. Peter, an apostle of Christ, the Lord rebuked him. And there are times a person may have a high calling, but does not know what the Lord has called you to do. And if you listen to that person, you're going to end up disobeying the Lord. And you are going to be in serious error. And it continues. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must 
deny himself and take up his cross and follow me deny himself take up his cross and follow me Jesus was going to take up his cross and Peter allowing the devil to speak through him was trying to stop Jesus from taking up the cross for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul or what will a man give in exchange for his soul for the son of man is going to come in the glory of his father with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds so Jesus spoke about discipleship and that there is a cost to following him and that cost may not be understood by your peers which may be a part of how offenses come they may get offended when you mention about what you have to do and you may get offended when they're trying to stop you from doing it at least with this Peter and Jesus did not split up after that incident turning to Luke 17 more about stumbling blocks or offenses Luke 17 starting verse 1 he said to his disciples it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come but woe to him through whom they come for it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea then he would then that he would cause one of these little ones to stumble and it continues and what you're hearing is similar to what what I said before and you may be like why is he reading that if he said it before I'm not offended and please don't get offended because I'm going through that because now it's about to take a turn and that's what needs to happen sometimes sometimes we need to hear people out because they may say something it starts off as being offensive and if we get offended and put our guards up and we stop listening we may not hear the rest of what they have to say so it continues be on your guard if your brother sins forgive him and if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying I repent forgive him did you notice something actually the way I read it is the way many people hear the scripture based on how it's preached based on how it's taught but we had to slow down because there was something I didn't say Jesus said it be on guard if your brother sins this is a part I didn't say if your brother sins rebuke him many people don't get a part if your brother sins rebuke him and if he repents forgive him now we know Jesus said in what many people call the Lord's Prayer when he was teaching his disciples how to pray and he spoke about if we do not forgive the father will not forgive us so yes we forgive but sometimes um we look at forgiveness as being reconciliation like letting someone back in letting them back into a form position that may, that may not be the case a person could get let in where you're cordial but you may no longer be best friends and it is for your safety and even that individual safety so again Jesus said be on your guard even though Peter was one of Jesus closest disciples Jesus still had to be on guard and he rebuked the devil out of Peter when Satan was trying to get him to to not fulfill his calling so be on guard be discerning if your brother sins don't forget this part <sighs> this bug if your brother sins rebuke him a lot of times that's the part that's missing the rebuke because sometimes in rebuking a person it gets a person's attention that you are in error or I don't agree with what you're saying 
and it causes a person to think. So rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Now forgive him anyhow. But regarding repentance determines if you can let a person back in. Like Peter. Peter did um, fall into apostasy. But Peter repented and the Lord let him back in. Judas, that's another story. So there's some people, when they repent, and repent means to truly turn away. And it's a, it's a change of mind, a change of heart. To where you did something before and you're not going to do that again. I mentioned about David. David repented. David was sent into exile for a while after the Bathsheba incident. David repented and he was allowed to sit back on the throne to reign over Israel. There are some people, you cannot allow them back in because basically they're trying to get within striking distance to in a sense give you that Judas kiss of death. And don't put limits on how many times you're going to forgive a person. But use wisdom regarding who you let back in. And if it sins against you seven times a day, and if he sins against you seven times a day, and returns to you seven times saying, I repent. That's key. Forgive him. A lot of times um, with the offense, people are offended. And it's a genuine incident. And because you're holding on to the incident, because when you look at it, it's like, yeah, they're right. That person was wrong and the other person was right. The person who's right then becomes offended, holds on to that offense, and that person falls into error. So forgive. You're releasing yourself, you're releasing that person, and you're releasing the entire situation to the Lord. You want to approach the Lord with a, with a right heart. Jesus spoke about if you have ought against your brother, <laughs> You lay that thing down, or you lay any kind of gifts you have to the Lord. Resolve the art you have between your brother, and then come to Him. So like some people, they're praising the Lord. Like even in church, they're praising the Lord, and then there's someone in the church that they hate. They're praising the Lord, and they can't sit beside someone because maybe some prejudice, maybe some things that happened in the past. Ooh. Now to the book of Acts. In verse 9, Paul, Saul of Tarsus, he used to persecute Christians until he had an encounter with the Lord. And a part of offense sometimes, we are looking at a person's past. Can I kind of mention about Kanye earlier? We're looking at a person's past so much that we can't even see that the blood of Jesus has cleansed that person's sin. And that person has a renewed heart. That person has repented. Mm. So in Acts 9, starting in verse 26. And when he, Paul, came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples. But they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. So again, Paul had a history, a history of persecuting Christians on behalf of the high priest. He had a reputation. And then now, these Holy Spirit-filled disciples are afraid of him because they do not believe he has had a conversion experience. And mind you, Paul did have a conversion experience on what we call Damascus Road, on his way to Damascus, with Jesus. Jesus had Ananias go lay hands on Paul and he became a minister, a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And these Holy Spirit filled disciples were afraid of him. And a part of it is, Paul had an, an experience with the Lord, but they did not know about it. Are we judging people because they may or may not have had an experience with the Lord, but because we don't know, we're going off their history? as opposed to their present? Are we so focused on people's past that we can't see their future? That the Lord has something for them? A plan for them to prosper just like He has a plan for you? So again, when he, Paul, came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But Barnabas 
took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked with him and how at Damascus he had been he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus are we speaking out against someone who's boldly speaking out in the name of Jesus sometimes even more bold than we are so at least Barnabas and the Lord will have a witness at least Barnabas witnessed what Paul had been doing and vouched for him in front of the Apostles now the Apostles could have prayed and asked the Lord Lord is this man Paul or Saul of Tarsus who's coming saying he's one of us is he really one of us and the Holy Spirit would have answered and of course one of the ways the Holy Spirit will answer is how Barnabas is vouching for Paul and he was with them moving about freely in Jerusalem speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord <laughs> and he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews but they were attempting to put him to death we have to be careful about speaking out for example against someone who's putting his or her life on the line to speak out about Jesus so Paul was speaking out against the Hellenistic Jews even though they were trying to kill him but when the brethren learned of it they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit it continued to increase Paul seemed like a very unlikely candidate I mean he was a man who consented to the death of Stephen Stephen had quite the reputation and it makes sense Stephen was killed the Saul raised up another who could do wonderful works there are times when their ministers in churches maybe they've been for example the pastor for many years or they've been in a church and the Lord wants to has wanted to use them but they went astray and the Lord may take someone outside of the church to build his church because his church isn't a building the ecclesia is the people the called out ones it's so important to have communion with the Holy Spirit and I want you to keep this in not in the back of your mind but in your forethought Barnabas was the one who brought Paul into the mist in Acts 13 start verse 1 now there were at Antioch in the church that was there prophets and teachers so again there were prophets after <laughs> after John the Baptist such as Agabus but prophets and teachers and it says Barnabas and Simeon who was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manaean who was who had been brought up with with Herod the tetrarch and Saul so I mentioned that they were prophets and teachers and it calls out Barnabas Simeon Lucius Manaean and Saul prophets and teachers while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting the Holy Spirit said set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them now we know that Jesus sent out his 70 disciples and he sent them out in pairs and the Holy Spirit 
connected Barnabas and Saul of Tarsus, Paul, and he was going to send him out on an assignment. The Holy Spirit put them together. Then, when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Cilicia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they reached Salamis, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they also had John as their helper. So the Holy Spirit selected Barnabas and Saul, also called Paul, to do the work of the Lord. He put them together. He mentioned here about the disciples laid hands on them. Sometimes one of the issues people have, they want to know, okay, who laid hands on you before um, you went out? Maybe no one did. Does that mean a person wasn't sent out by the Lord? Another thing is, it says that they had John as their helper. So again, please keep in mind, Barnabas was the one who brought Paul into the fold. The Holy Spirit selected Barnabas and Paul to go out on an assignment and they had John with them. As I get ready to wind down, I'm actually going to read the entire entirety of Acts 15. So please bear with me. So again, Barnabas was the one who brought Paul into the midst. The Holy Spirit selected Barnabas and Paul to go on an assignment and they had John with them. Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. You may have heard people preaching nowadays about Torah observance. I recently did a video about Melchizedek and one of the things I mentioned is that if someone's going to be preaching about tithing that person better be circumcised because of course we're talking about a man but tithing was a part of the law and circumcision was a part of the law and if a man is not circumcised don't even speak about tithing and again like what I said in that video Abraham was circumcised at age 99 so there's no excuse if a person is so adamant about tithing, if a person is so adamant about keeping the law. So they're saying, unless you're circumcised. And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, so Paul and Barnabas, they were united that no, these people, the Gentiles, do not need to be circumcised. So debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. So it's not something. There are times when we're debating about things and it's like we're arguing amongst ourselves. How about seeking wise counsel? There is a safety in multitude of not only wise but godly counselors. And a part of why the Bible says wise counselors, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So there's safety in a multitude of counselors, but they need to be wise counselors. Therefore, being sent on their way by the church, they were passing through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and were bringing great joy to all the brethren. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees, oh boy, here we go again. And we still have people today who are like the Pharisees. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, 
it is necessary to circumcise them and direct them to observe the law of Moses. So it is great. These Pharisees, they believed in Jesus, but they had not been fully converted because here it is, they're saying it is necessary to circumcise them and direct them to observe the law of Moses. So at the time, they were using the scriptures. Again, Jesus said that the word he was speaking, that they were spirit. They were also life, but they were spirit. And which will need the Holy Spirit to help us interpret scriptures, to guide us into all truth, which is a part of the reason why Jesus sent him. So these Pharisees, it was good. They believed in Jesus, so it's like they were Messianic Jews. So they believed that Jesus was and is the Messiah. But they're telling people that they need to be circumcised and observe the law of Moses. This is what some people call um, dual covenant theology. Even Seventh-day Adventists trying to keep the Sabbath. It's a dual covenant theology. Trying to keep the old covenant and the new. And when you read Hebrews 7 through 8, which was also um, the last video that I did about Melchizedek, it speaks about how the new covenant basically overwrote the old. And continuing, the apostles and elders came together to look into this matter. Every time I look down, the same old bug trying to come upon me. Uh oh. It reminds me of a dream that I had had about Brian Karn. Please pray for that young man, Brian Karn. Wow. The apostles and elders came together to look into this matter. After there had been much debate, and debate is a way of causing offense, people trying to prove their point, and sometimes like a dog chasing, chasing its tail, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days of God, in the early days, God made a choice among you, that by my mouth, that Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit. And that is an honor to have the Holy Spirit, because it's through the Holy Spirit that we're sealed unto the day of redemption, marking us as being a child of God. Just as he also did with us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Faith. Now therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the necks of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? So there are many people who are Torah observant and is trying to keep two covenants. They're trying to put a yoke on themselves that the Jews in times past could not fulfill because the law was a schoolmaster to take us to Jesus. It showed us how flawed we were, that we couldn't do things independent of the Lord. Jesus is the only one who could keep law perfectly. No one else could. Through Jesus, we have grace. And I read before in the other teaching, but I'll go there real quick. In John 1 verse 14, I believe. Correction. Actually, I'll read verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And Jesus is the Word. And we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about Him and cried out, saying, This is He whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for He existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. And verse 17 is key. 
For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. So Jesus came with grace and truth. So rather than the law being that was written on tablets, now the law is written on the tablet of our hearts. So Peter mentioned about the Lord did not make a distinction between Jews and Gentiles, cleansing our hearts. And again, now therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the necks of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? And it continues, but we believe that we are saved through the grace of of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are all the people kept silent and this is a great thing when there's offense sometimes to keep silent process the information seek the Lord for guidance and if we say something that is offensive sometimes we have to retract it now it's like a a bullet has been fired out of a weapon we can't stop it, but if we say something and realize that it's out of turn, we can apologize. And then there are some things where you say it and it's going to be unapologetic, even though it's offensive. It's kind of like how John the Baptist told King Herod that it was wrong for him to marry his brother's, Philip's wife, Herodias. That was offensive. Herodias didn't like it. She wanted him dead. But it was the truth, and they needed to repent. So all the people kept silent, and they were listening to Barnabas and Paul as they were relating what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they had stopped speaking, James answered, saying, Brethren, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first concerned himself about talking or taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. With this the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After these things I will return, and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David which has fallen, and I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from long ago. Therefore, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles. When a person is turned to the Lord, be careful that you do not create stumbling blocks, telling them that they must do things to be saved when that is not a part of the requirement to be saved. But that we write to them that they abstain from things contaminated by idols and from fornication and from what is strangled and from blood. Isn't that something? That was the requirement. It wasn't about keeping the law of Moses. The Gentiles were to abstain from things contaminated by idols and from fornication and from what is strangled and from blood. It's just that simple. No keeping the laws. For Moses, from ancient generations, has in every city those who preach him, since he is read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Then it seemed good to the apostles and elders. These bugs are having a field day with me. With the whole church to choose men from among them to send to Antioch, with Paul and Barnabas, Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. 
and they sent this letter to them. The apostles and brethren who are elders to the brethren in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia who are from the Gentiles. Greetings. Since we have heard that some of our number to whom we gave no instruction, many people are running as if the Lord has spoken to them, but he has not. He has not given them instruction. So again, since we have heard that some of our number to whom we gave no instruction have disturbed you with their words on settling your souls. And some things, it just won't resonate with you. It will grieve your spirit. So on settling your souls. It seemed good to us, having become of one mind. It's amazing that with the same Holy Spirit, we have so much division within the body of Christ. It seemed good to us, having become of one mind, to select men to send to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. Men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we have sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will report the same things by word of mouth. And this part right here. I just saw someone read this once, and it seemed as if the person just glazed over this, and the person was a torrent observant Christian. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials, that you abstain from things sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication. Again, the Holy Spirit of true and living God said this. Why are people trying to add to what the Holy Spirit of the Lord has already declared? If you keep yourselves free from such things, you will do well. Farewell. So when they were sent away, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. When they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. They were set free, not being put under the bondage, the yoke of the law. They were set free. There were still requirements to keep, but they were set free from the law. So Judas and Silas, also being prophets themselves, encouraged and strengthened the brethren with a lengthy message. This message is also lengthy. After they had spent time there, they were sent away from the brethren in peace to those who had sent them out. But it seemed good to Silas to remain there. But Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch, teaching and preaching, with many others also, the word of the Lord. And I'm almost done. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaimed the word of the Lord and see how they are. I pause. Remember, Barnabas was the one who got Paul into the fellowship. The Holy Spirit said, select or set aside Barnabas and Saul, Paul, for the work that he has appointed to them. They were minister partners. On their assignment, they took John with them. And now look what happened. Barnabas wanted to take John, called Mark, along with them also. But Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along, who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to do the work. So Paul remembered what John, also called Mark, had done. And he didn't want to take him with him because he had shown himself untrustworthy. And when someone betrays your trust, it is hard to let them back in, even if after you've forgiven them. Now Barnabas 
he'd put that behind him. But for Paul, it was like, oh no, I don't want him to come along. So now you have an offense. What were they going to do about it? Were these two men who the Holy Spirit had put together, were they going to let that offense cause a fence to rise up between them? Hmm. In a second. And there occurred a sharp disagreement, that offense, that they separated from one another, and Barnabas took Mark, John called Mark, with him, and sailed away to Cyprus. So they had a disagreement. And the solution was, Barnabas wanted John also called Mark to go with them. So Barnabas got what he wanted, and he and Mark, they went their separate ways. Again, the Holy Spirit had put them together. There are times when the Holy Spirit and I'm receiving a revelation right now. There are times when the Holy Spirit puts you together with someone. You have started. Your time has come to an end. And you're thinking that because the Holy Spirit put you with that person, because the Holy Spirit put you in that church, that you still need to remain there. Now, it is great to get a release from the Holy Spirit. But actually sometimes how things start is by... The Lord may allow a, a dispute, some kind of contention to arise. In some cases, drive people apart. The Lord told Abraham to go to a land that he will show him. Abraham took off on a journey. Abraham should have left Lot behind, but he took Lot with him. That's Genesis 12. In Genesis 13, we see how because the Lord had blessed both men to the point where their shepherds started having arguments. There were, there were offenses because there was enough land for both of them to coexist. And they split. Lot went his way. Abraham went another direction. I'm sorry about that. My camera actually cut off. And um, it's a new day. I'm going to finish this recording. Yesterday when I stopped recording. I was at Acts 15. Starting verse 39. And I say this again. And there occurred such a sharp disagreement. That they separated one from another and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus so there are times when even the Holy Spirit puts something together puts two people together where it is time to go apart but it's not always a bad thing I mean Abraham and Lot, Lot going in opposite directions it was a great thing for Abraham it allowed him to in a sense walk into his blessings Barnabas he was very helpful regarding launching Paul's ministry, getting him into fellowship with the brethren. And it continues, But Paul chose Silas and left, being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. And he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So at one point, you had two men, Barnabas and Paul they had a ministry together ministering for the Lord but imagine if they had stuck together because Barnabas went opposite direction with or in another direction with Mark Mark got a chance to get strengthened Paul he walked into full into the fullness of his calling and he also was able to strengthen Silas and when we look at the Bible Paul is credited with writing most of the books in the New Testament. So in that case, the offense was not a bad thing. But there are times when people need to work things out. And because of some minor offense, they end up splitting apart. And that is not a good thing. There's also that saying about good fences make good neighbors. There's sometimes you have neighbors and you need to have a fence dividing you. There are people in the park as I'm speaking about neighbors and fences. Sometimes you need a fence between you. Let's say, for example, you have a neighbor that has dogs and you don't. Do you want to be walking around in your yard and stepping in piles of feces coming from your neighbor? 
and that's an example of where a fence is a good thing but we have to be careful why in a wide open space some people coming beside me as I'm recording that they can see making noise oh the devil is a liar but am I gonna get offended no I'm just gonna keep on doing what the Lord has called me to do so yesterday I mentioned many things and I finished it up today that it was because of an offense why Paul and Barnabas separated but it wasn't necessarily a bad thing we didn't hear much about Barnabas or anything about Barnabas after that but we know about Paul he fulfilled the calling that the Lord called him to do because there are times when we try holding on to something try holding on to someone too long Jesus said woe unto those about offenses coming sometimes he causes the offense but like I mentioned yesterday we had to be careful that we are not the offender and yes there are times when we may be offensive in telling the truth Paul wrote in the book of Galatians am I therefore your enemy because I tell you the truth the truth has a potential to hurt and some people are going to be offended by it but don't stop telling the truth but some people are brutally honest and they tell the truth in order to cause harm so be careful about being an offender where you're just going around offending people be careful about speaking about things that you do not have personal knowledge about and based on your limited experience you try telling people that maybe what they're going through is not real what they're going through is not of the Lord and you may end up pushing them into the kingdom of darkness because the enemy he comes to bring ungodly division so we have to be careful about being the offender and also about being offended there are times if you're offended speak to the person let the person know that he or she offended you because in some cases it's not you who needs to repent but it's the person in all things ensure the Holy Spirit of the Lord is leading you there's a place and a time to be offended or be offensive and it's a good thing and sometimes it is not again those who are led by the Spirit of God they are the sons of God so do not allow offense to become a fence that separates you from the things the Lord has for you do not allow offense to become a fence that causes you to not forgive others now I did read yesterday that Jesus said that if our brother basically sins against us and comes and repents about rebuking that brother the brother repents and we forgive that brother now if a person doesn't repent the other side of that is when the Lord taught his disciples how to pray he mentioned that if we do not forgive the Father will not forgive us so by all means forgive people but forgiveness is not always about reconciliation Paul there was an offense with Mark John Mark and Paul we can say that Paul had forgiven him but Paul was not going to allow John or Mark to be in a position to let him down again a lot of things I pray that this was beneficial and by the way today is a little bit different it's later in the evening and it is colder even my, the back of my head is freezing right now so um, these outdoor recordings may stop for the foreseeable future God bless you if you're offended sometimes you just have to let that stuff go forgive people you're releasing that person you're releasing yourself and you're releasing everything to the Lord for him to handle it if it's something that needs vengeance the Lord said that vengeance is his and he will avenge but we're also told do not gloat when you see the downfall of your enemy lest the rat Lord turn his wrath away from the person plus it's displeasing to the Lord offense is one of the things that the enemy uses to create a fence to cause division in the body of Christ and for as much as possible we need to be unified God bless you Jesus the undisputed King he is Lord